Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. So we're going to start our um, Lewis Berry History Lovers presentation. Um, this month, you have to listen to me talk. But in January, Jerry Jones, the renowned geologist, is going to be here. And he's going to give a talk in January. Um, but for today, we are going to learn about the 87th Pennsylvania, which is a Civil War regiment that was historically recruited out of York County. And I happen to be a Civil War reenactor with the 87th Pennsylvania Company C. Um, if you remember the last talk that I did when I was here, I spoke about women in the Civil War and my experience being a Civil War reenactor as a woman pretending to be a man in the infantry. Um, but this is a uh, more historical deep dive into the 87th Pennsylvania. So they were dubbed the boys from York, and the 87th Pennsylvania was organized in York and mustered in for three-year enlistment in September of 1861 under the command of Colonel George Hay. And Lewis Miller, who is a famous artist from York County, Pennsylvania, ended up painting and drawing pictures of the 87th when they were mustering. So June Lloyd writes, Miller was evidently in York in 1861 when he drew military camp on the fairgrounds at the time near the intersection of King and Queen Streets. The site had been converted to a training facility for Colonel George Hayes 87th Pennsylvania Volunteer Regiment soon after the commencement of the Civil War. One of the two related pieces depicts half the regiment marching off for the depot on September 16th, and another, dated September 28th, shows the remaining companies at York's Northern Central Railroad Station, embarking to join their comrades guarding the railroad's track north of Baltimore. Local people of all ages are pictured giving them a hearty send-off. And this is called the Drawing to Represent, and that was by famous York artist Lewis Miller. And then we have our detailed service. So this is called a record banner. And this is available at the Civil War Flag Education Center in Harrisburg on Forrester Street. You can actually go see it along with all of the other Civil War flags that were used in Pennsylvania during the Civil War. And the record banner shows that um, the 87th was involved in a lot of different um, campaigns. And it was composed of men from York, Adams, Cumberland, Dolphin, Allegheny, Lawrence, and Franklin counties and it was organized in September of 1861, and the state color was presented to seven companies of the regiment in Monument Square of Baltimore on February 27, 1862. In late 1864, those who did not re-enlist um, took the small remnant of the state color home and gave it to George Hay and the regiment's first colonel. Because most of the flag was shot to pieces, their survivors made this small banner with the names of the major engagements that the 87th fought. So the um, museum, the Preservation Center doesn't have our original flag because not only was it shot to pieces, the veterans cut it up and gave it to each other for sentimental purposes, which was not you know, uncommon at the time. So they had this made uh, specifically. And the rest of the regiment was mustered out of service on June 29th, 1865. And the organization of the 87th. So getting the troops ready was a country or countywide affair. The Hans Brothers Hardware Store in New York supplied the gunpowder. PA and S. Smalls Hardware donated lead for the bullets, and blacksmith Jacob Dieter and tinsmith George Waits cast 40 rounds of bullets per man in York. Companies A and K were mainly from York Borough. Company B had about 45 men from Newberry Township, and they were dubbed the Mongrel Unit. Um, I'm not really sure why they were called the Mongrels, but I guess there's something about guys from Newberry. Um, company C and D had farm boys and laborers from Southern York County, and Company E had the highest casualty rate. Company F was from Gettysburg, and that was made famous because of Jenny Wade and John Skelly. Company G was a company with problems. That's all they say in the history book, a company with problems. And then Company H was the men from Wellsville, and Company I were the men from New Oxford. So if you are born and raised in any of these parts of York County, you probably have ancestors that were in the 87th. So this starts with September 14, 1861. And this shows you the York fairground, uh, fairgrounds that were then southeast of King and Queen Streets in York, and that became the venue for the Green Recruits. So a lot of these men had never been more than a few miles away from home, never been off the farm, never in a real military unit. So they really had to take a lot of time to drill these men and get them ready for service. 
1861, they started guarding the Northern Central Railway. So um, a quote here says, we're all getting a long fine here, plenty to eat and nothing to do, doing guard duty and fishing and catching a great many things that did not look like fish. Some had frocks on and some had feathers. <laughs> so that's from George Washington Shriver. So um, on the 28th of September, the regiment traveled by rail through Hanover Junction and Glen Rock down to Cockeysville, Maryland, where the men guarded the bridges of the Northern Central Railway until 1862, and then they went to Baltimore. Um, time really drug on for the men. Um, they were waiting for active duty, and the leadership issues led to discipline issues, and discipline issues led to low morale and harsh punishment. So you can understand why they said Company G was a company with problems, and maybe why Newberry was full of mongrels. They were just really waiting to see some action at that point. That leads us to the middle department in 1862. They attached to the railroad guard in May of 1862, and then they went to Baltimore, Maryland in June of 1862. The 87th was then at New Creek, West Virginia until August 20th. They had an expedition under General Kelly across Laurel Hill and Rich Mountain from August 27th to September 12th. And then they had an expedition over Cheat and Allegheny Mountains from October 31st to November 12th. And then they were present for the March on Petersburg, West Virginia on December 6th through the 9th. In January of 1862, the Wrightsville Star stopped publication because five of its staff members joined the army. So that just goes to show you the local implications of the war and the fact that entire companies had to shut down because they didn't have the employees. All of the men um, were out at war and traditionally women weren't in the newspaper business at that time. And that leads us to June 13th to the 15th, 1863 and the sac second battle of Winchester. The 87th engaged in a sharp firefight with Confederate Maryland Cavalry under Major Harry Gilmore along today's Route 11 south of Winchester, Virginia. This skirmish marked the opening shots of what would become known as the Second Battle of Winchester, culminating in the early morning hours of June 15th with the surrender of almost half of the regiment at Carter's Woods after Major General Robert H. Milroy desperately tried to get most of his 8,000 man division of the 8th Army Corps out of the encirclement in Westchester, Winchester. On Sunday the 14th, Milroy had stayed put in Winchester against the orders of the War Department in Washington, D.C. All day Sunday, Milroy was up on a lookout 40 feet above the works with a field glass in hand watching Lee's veterans closing around our brave and devoted little army, the 87th Lieutenant Colonel James A. Stahl later penned. What an uncomfortable time we had, he lamented. No sleep, no rest for two days, rations were getting short and everybody wet to the skin, all ready for immediate action with the outlook anything but assuring. We knew we were being surrounded on all sides, Stahl continued. The rebel pickets were out on every road. It is any wonder that the men became despondent and lost heart. And that's an excerpt from Scott Mingus's uh, Baptism Under Fire in the Civil War. So if anyone knows anything about local Civil War history, Scott Mingus is your go-to author. He's great, he has multiple books on the topic. So I would highly suggest buying those books. About 4,000 men were taken prisoner or missing during this war or this battle. And the news of the Confederate victory so close to the Mason-Dixon line was a shock to many. Secretary of War Edward Stanton called for militia units to be federalized and President Abraham Lincoln called for 100,000 volunteers. And Pennsylvania Governor Andrew Curtin called for 50,000 volunteers just from Pennsylvania alone. And that leads us to June 28, 1863, and the Confederate occupation of York County. And I have another painting or drawing from Lewis Miller. And this artwork depicts the scenes of the three-day Confederate occupation of the town before the Southern Army was called away to the gathering storm at Gettysburg. One view shows the invading army marching toward Center Square, and the other depicts an outsized American flag being taken down from the tall flagpole in the square and being handed over to Confederate officers. He wrote of literally hearing the Battle of Gettysburg a few days later. I heard the cannons roar, not 29 miles from where I stood in Old York. So that really gives you an idea of how loud and how big the battle was that you could hear it in York. General Gordon arrived with General Jubal Early, each leading divisions down the streets of York, making it the largest and northernmost town to be occupied by Confederate forces. So how many of you knew that uh, history of York County, that we were the northernmost? Um, city to be occupied by the Confederates. That's usually something that you don't necessarily learn about in your high school history class. Um, the soldiers marched to the center of town and removed the large U.S. flag hanging on the pole. 
yet they did not raise another in its place. A lot of people will say that the Confederate flag flew in York. That's not true. They didn't raise it. And apparently at Farquhar's request, this didn't happen. So Farquhar Park in York is named after Farquhar. And, but accepting York's surrender didn't mean that the town would escape with no consequences. General Early promptly demanded supplies for his troops along with $100,000 in cash, or he would sack the place in spite of their surrender. During the three-day occupation, the quotas of bread, sugar, coffee, molasses, meat, shoes, hats, and socks were all met, but only $28,600 were raised from the citizens of York. General Early took what he was given, and he refrained from his threat of violence, keeping the soldiers under strict orders not to harm the town. And that's a first-hand account of the occupation by Ann Mayer. And that leads us to the famous burning of the Wrightsville Bridge. Now, the 87th wasn't there. Um, some members of the 87th might have been in town and might have been around, but you have to understand at this time, um, we were engaged farther south in the middle department. Um, but a lot of citizens of York were there, Columbia, they were all watching this happen. At first, they wanted to just blow up the first portion of the bridge so they could take out the first section so the Confederates couldn't get through. But the bridge was constructed so well that it didn't work. So they had to light it on fire. And again, they only really wanted the first section of the bridge to burn or blow up, but it was a wooden bridge. So you can imagine the entire thing went down, but it did help um, the war effort. Can I interject something? Yes. You know about the buckets, right? Yes. And that's a, that's a cute story. With the, there's no buckets available for the Confederates to put the bridge out. Right. Until several of the houses <clears throat> near the bridge caught on fire and there were buckets galore. Confederates helped put out the residents' homes that were on fire. And that evening, one of the ladies there had a tremendous meal for all the officers, Confederate officers and everything else, as a thanks for saving her house. Yes. So. Um, General Gordon arrived with, uh, oh, sorry. So this brings us to uh, Mine Run. So this is November 27th, December 2nd, 1863. So um, morale was up on uh, November 20th and the 87th had just been paid. So you can imagine if you're a soldier in the Civil War, you're making about 12 to $13 a month. If you're not getting paid, your morale's gonna be low. You have to keep your soldiers happy. You have to feed them and you have to pay them. So they were finally paid on the 20th of November. And November 26th saw 525 members of the 87th cross the Rappahedon River by Bontoon Bridge. After trudging through the wilderness, the 87th met up with the 138th Pennsylvania. They were completely exposed in a horseshoe formation. When the 138th fell back under a rebel surge, the 87th was left completely alone and they ended up having to run into the woods. The weather took a toll overnight and pickets had to change every half an hour to avoid getting frostbite. And the water ended up freezing in their canteens overnight. That brings us to May 5th and 6th, 1864, and the Battle of the Wilderness. So the first Battle of Grand's 1864 Overland Campaign was the Battle of the Wilderness. The Army of the Potomac leave winter camps in Culliper County, and they march south toward the Rappahedon River. The arrival of the Union Sixth Corps does little more than broaden the front and lengthen the list of casualties. Longstreet is wounded on May 6th, and this leads to both sides really digging in. And the battle ended up being a tactical draw and estimated to be the fourth bloodiest battle of the Civil War. So in my opinion, the wilderness doesn't get as much publicity as it should. It's the fourth bloodiest battle of the Civil War and you don't hear it talked about enough. And that leads us to the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse, May 8th to the 21st, 1864. This was a 15 hour march brought by the 87th to the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse. So you can imagine marching 15 miles and then immediately going into battle. The average Civil War soldier when they would go on marches would be marching about 20 to 25 miles. And the battle took place over 12 days and it cost 18,000 Union casualties and 12,000 Confederate casualties. Grant won a strategic victory in the end by moving around Lee's flank and continuing his advance on Richmond. On May 8th during the fight, Major General John Sedgwick, commander of the Union Sixth Corps, is shot dead, and he became the highest ranking Union officer killed during the war at that time. And that leads us to the Battle of Cold Harbor, June 1st to the 12th, 1864. The small crossroads of Cold Harbor, just 10 miles north of Richmond, became the vocal point for the action in late May. 
Hearing reports that Lee is extending his line to the James River, Grant is determined to extend his left flank and overpower Lee and come between the Confederates and Richmond, all while keeping access to the James River open for the Union. Confused orders and bad roads slowed the movement of the two federal corps. The 6th, the 2nd, and the 18th Corps launched the main attack through the darkness and the fog. Angles in the Confederate works allow Lee's men to easily inflate the federal ranks as they advance, and an estimated 7,000 men are killed or wounded within the first 30 minutes. The first 30 minutes, you have 7,000 casualties. That's an extreme amount of men to be killed. And the days are filled with minor attacks, artillery duels, and sniping. On June 7th, Lee and Grant agreed to a two-hour truce to allow Federals a chance to retrieve their wounded and their dying. Reflecting later in the battle, Grant wrote, I have always regretted that the last assault at Cold Harbor was ever made. No advantage whatever was gained to compensate for the heavy loss we sustained. So during the Civil War, if you wanted to go retrieve your dead or your wounded, you didn't run out in the middle of the fighting. You were going to get shot. So you had to wait for the battle to be over. So if a battle took a few days, if you were wounded, you would literally lay in the field with nothing but your canteen for a little bit of water until they could get to you. So a lot of men who probably would have survived ended up dying because they couldn't be retrieved until the battles were over. So that's why these truces were called. The battle that saved Washington, July 9th, 1864, the Battle of Monocacy. So this is a reenactment that my group, the 87th, we take part in. Uh, we go to the Monocacy battlefield and we do a living history every year around the anniversary. And this year we were able to go to our battle line and we took pictures um, in our uniforms to see what it would have been like. So the Battle of Monocacy began around 8.30 a.m. when Confederate skirmishers commanded by General Stephen Rampshire. Confederates looked for another way to cross the river and the Confederate General John McClausland cavalrymen found the Washington or the Worthington Fort almost a mile down river of the wooden covered bridge and by 10:30 a.m. had began to cross placing pressure on Wallace's forces south of the river when the Confederates gained control of the Thomas farm they were soon pushed back by federal forces in a savage counterattack field maps like this one was made for the Battle of Monocacy by Jedediah Hotchkiss, and it provided valuable aid to commanders planning their battle strategies. So they didn't have drones, they didn't have computer and radar to be able to look at what they were walking into. So they would take maps and they would try and mark where um, the enemies were, where they were, and try and figure out the best route to take. And while the Confederates had won the Battle of Monocacy, Lew Wallace was ultimately successful and his efforts delayed Jubal Early's advance long enough for additional Union reinforcements to reach Washington, D.C. and Early wasn't able to take Washington. So that's why this is called the battle that saved Washington. So you don't necessarily have to win the battle to win the war. So this is a good example of that. And that leads us to August uh, 1864 to October 1864 and the third battle of Winchester or Fisher's Hill. So you have to remember that the Confederates and the Union, even though they were fighting in one battle, a lot of times they would name them something different. Um, usually they were like local names. So if the locals called it one thing, um, sometimes the invading army would call it something different. So historically it's known as the Third Battle of Winchester or Fisher's Hill. The Union victory at the Third Winchester began a series of losses for early in the valley from which it would never recover. And the battle was the largest and costliest fought in the Shenandoah Valley. The veterans of Stonewall Jackson fired amazingly low so that the grass and the earth in front of the regiment was cut and torn up by a perfect sheet of lead. And that is an excerpt from Union Surgeon Harris H. Beecher of the 114th New York Infantry. And I got a lot of my quotes from the York History Center, so shout out to them. If you're ever looking for information on your ancestors and Civil War history that's local, go to the York History Center. They have a lot of diaries and letters from veterans. And Major General Jubal Early's army took up a defensive position at Fisher's Hill. The Confederates folded under the Union forces and opened the valley to Sheridan's two-week scorched earth operations. And I'm sure we're all familiar with the scorched earth policy that Sheridan had. He just cut a swath anywhere he went. They burned the town. They took whatever they could to eat, and he just burned the place down. October 19th, 1864, the Battle of Cedar Creek. This is also an annual reenactment that the 87th Regiment, the reenactors, take part in. And Early executed a surprise attack early on October 19th and drove three Union Corps from the field. 
As early paused to reorganize, Sheridan arrived after a dramatic ride from Winchester in time to rally his troops and launch a crushing counterattack from which Early's forces could not recover. One of the Union's victories in late 1864 that helped ensure President Abraham Lincoln's re-election in November. So you have to remember uh, re-elections and elections during wartime. If you want to be re-elected, you have to have your troops behind you, you have to have high morale, and the people in your country have to have hope that you're going to win the war. So that really helped uh, bolster Lincoln's reelection. And you can still go biddle, uh, uh, you can still go visit the uh, Cedar Creek Battlefield and Bell Grove House that's there. Um, April 2nd, 1865, Petersburg. The Siege of Petersburg continues to be known as an early example of trench warfare. A lot of people associate trench warfare with World War I, and that is a much more modern, advanced version of trench warfare, but there was trench warfare being used during the Civil War. The Sixth Corps responsibility for bust, the Sixth Corps had the responsibility for busting through the Confederates' line. And the First Brigade, the Third Division, and the Sixth Army Corps is the organization that did that. Grant then constructed trenches around the eastern portion of the Richmond to the outskirts of Petersburg. The city was a major supply hub to the Confederate Army. And that was led by Robert E. Lee, who finally abandoned the city in 1865 and retreated, which led afterward to his ultimate surrender at Appomattox Courthouse. So in the South, they had a lot of issues with supplies. We had better railroads in the North. We could get supplies to our army. And we had um, just all around better transportation. In the South, if you had a supply hub and you lost it, that entire portion of the country was basically cut off. So the fact that Lee lost that major supply hub in Petersburg, it really crippled him and it led to his surrender. And then we have the famous painting of the surrender at Appomattox Courthouse on April 9th, 1865. And he formally surrendered there and you can see the Union forces and then Lee signing his surrender. Uh, the 87th mustered out on June 29, 1865. The regiment lost a total of 202 men during service, and 10 officers and 80 enlisted men were killed or mortally wounded. 112 enlisted men died from disease-related causes. Because you have to remember, during the Civil War, the bullets weren't the deadliest thing. The disease was the deadliest thing. They didn't have germ theory then. Your surgeon would amputate your leg, wipe off his knife on his... Uh, shirt and move on to the next person. They didn't have soap. They didn't realize that hot water was going to kill germs. Um, they didn't have Neosporin and Band-Aids. So it was a really messy time to be alive. And if you survived your wounds, you were probably going to have an infection in that wound that could kill you. Dysentery was running rampant. You had cholera. Uh, you had bad water, spoiled food. So disease was really what was killing the men. And that brings us to the 87th today. So the 87th Regiment Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry Company C is a family-oriented, nonprofit Civil War reenacting and living history organization. It is dedicated to the better understanding and preservation of the history of the American Civil War. The 87th Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry Company C participates in major battle reenactments and living history events, which are conducted for public education. The company also lends its support to the preservation of battlefields, monuments, and historic sites of the Civil War. Almost all of our active members have ancestors that served in the 87th and specifically in Company C. Uh, one, general, or one gentleman, I believe, has like three or four ancestors. I have one that was in the 87th. And these are some pictures. We were on the news for the Mom Paw Railroad, and that's me in the black hat. And then this is a picture from the new Sight and Sound movie that comes out on DVD on November 14th. They needed some reenactors as extras, so the 87th was invited to be a part of that. And now I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the famous boys from York that were in the 87th. So I'm sure you're gonna um, know about some of these names, but Colonel George Hay, he worked in the dry goods business in York before the war, and he was a first lieutenant for the York Rifles. He received authority from the Secretary of War, Simon Cameron, to organize a regiment at York. And if you're not familiar with Simon Cameron, you can visit his house on Front Street in Harrisburg, it is now part of the Dolphin County Historical Society, the Harris Cameron Mansion. And he was appointed colonel but declined to accept and he was made lieutenant colonel and served as such until May 9, 1862 when he was promoted to uh, colonel of his regiment. And he 
died in uh, 1879, and he's buried at Prospect Hill Cemetery in New York. So Prospect Hill Cemetery has a lot of Civil War veterans, specifically a lot of the 87. And then we have uh, Colonel John William Shaw. Uh, he worked, oh, I read you the wrong bio. So that bio I just read you was for Colonel John William Shaw. So he worked in the dry goods business. So sorry about that, everybody. So Colonel Hay, uh, I'll read it to you again, was born in New York in 1809. He was the Colonel of the 87th and he commanded the 1st Brigade, 2nd Division, 8th Army Corps. Hay was one of the five delegates who met with the Confederate Brig Brigadier General John B. Gordon of the on June 27, 1863, to discuss the terms by which the Confederates would occupy the borough the following day. Hence, York became the largest northern town to fall to the rebels during the Civil War. He died in 1879, and he's buried in Prospect Hill Cemetery. And uh, William John Shaw is also buried in uh, Prospect Hill Cemetery. And then we have John Hastings, Jack Skelly, and he is most famous for being Jenny Wade's boyfriend or fiance. Um, born in Gettysburg in 1841, he was a corporal in the 87th and a close friend of Jenny Wade's. We only know this because there were some letters written back and forth between them that survived the war. And then he died a result of his wounds sustained at the Second Battle of Winchester in 1863, and he's buried in Gettysburg at the Evergreen Cemetery near Jenny Wade. And if you go to the Appalachian Brewing, restaurant in Gettysburg. There's a little monument and plaque that talks about the 87th and it talks about Jack Skelly. I'm not sure why they chose that exact spot. It's sort of hidden by bushes, um, but if you're ever in the beer garden, it's right there. You can't miss it. Uh, and then we have Jeremiah Spar. So this actually is my third great grandfather. Uh, he was born on July 9th, 1840 in Warrington Township and he enlisted on September 9th, 1861 and he was in Company H. Uh, he ended up being arrested for murder on July 24th, 1863. He walked back from the Second Battle of Winchester with nothing but his rifle and what he had on his back, and he returned home to find that a black Confederate spy had stolen his horse. Um, back during the Civil War, horse thievery was punishable by death, so Jeremiah Spar and his brothers and some friends from the regiment got together and they lynched this man, unfortunately. Um, so by today's standards, not the greatest thing to have an ancestor known for. Um, by Civil War standards, it wasn't that horrible. He went on to be court-martialed and the judge ended up acquitting him. So he was never uh, formally convicted of any crimes. Uh, he died on November 26, uh, 1926, and he's buried in Parkville Cemetery in Dover. And Scott Mingus has a great presentation about murder mysteries of the Civil War. And he talks about Jeremiah Spar in that, which is how I learned about this in the first place. <laughs> uh, and then we have Lieutenant Colonel James Alonzo Stahl. So Stahl was born in West Manchester Township, and he attended the common schools and York Academy for his education. He learned the printing trade and, letter, and later became a merchant tailor. He enlisted as Company A, 87th Pennsylvania Infantry, and rose to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. He served as Deputy Collector of the Internal Revenue in York from 1869 to 1885, and he's buried in uh, 1912, and he, or he died in 1912 and is buried in Prospect Hill Cemetery. So that's another place, again, Prospect Hill Cemetery, if you ever go on any of their free tours, um, they offer them throughout the year. You can just ride around for free, you make an appointment, but they'll take you through the cemetery, and they like to point out a lot of the um, war heroes that they have there. And then we have James H. Moody, and he enlisted in Shrewsbury in Southern New York County on August 13, 1861 in Company D. On June 12, Moody was taken captive in a skirmish near Winchester and later transported with a long column of other prisoners to Libby Prison in Richmond. And if you know anything about Civil War prisons, you did not want to be there. It was horrible and you were most likely going to die of malnutrition or you were going to get a disease or an infection. From a private when enlisting, Mr. Moody, by showing himself as a real soldier, got to be a corporal and was promoted to be a line sergeant at the time of his discharge, so he did survive the prison experience. And he was a veteran, a uh, Glenrock veteran, and he served in the 87th Pennsylvania, captured at 2nd Winchester, and that is from his obituary that you can see that we found in the newspaper. And he died in 1930, and he's buried in Glenrock. And then our most famous member of the 87th is the one that won the Medal of Honor. So he was born in Adams County in 1841 and he joined the army in 1861 and he received the Medal of Honor for gallantry 
during the Battle of Cedar Creek, and he was promoted to sergeant in 1864. And I believe his Medal of Honor is being kept, um, I believe it was at Cedar Creek, but it might actually now be in the archives at the Gettysburg National Military Site, but don't quote me on that. Um, and the President of the United States of America, in the name of Congress, takes the pleasure in presenting the Medal of Honor to Corporal Daniel P. Regal, United States Army, for extraordinary heroism on the 19th October, 1864, while serving with Company F, 87th Pennsylvania, in action at Cedar Creek, Virginia, for gallantly while rushing forward to capture Confederate flag at the stone fence where the enemy's last stand was made. So during the Civil War, one of your most important jobs, if you were a flag bearer, was to make sure that the flag never touched the ground and the enemy never captured your flag. So to have your flag captured pretty much meant that the enemy, the enemy now won the battle. So he was able to capture that flag for the Union. And then when I was searching the archives, I found this song, uh, or poem you could call it, uh, called The Galleon 87th, and this is by John Clutter Hoffman of the 87th Pennsylvania, and it's written in the measure and the rhythm of Longfellow's Excelsior. And it goes, the 87th, recalled to city point we ship on transports or the waves we skip, as though bound on a pleasure trip, the Galleon 87th. To save the capital, we speed to Baltimore, to Wallace aid, to check bold early in his raid, the Galleon 87th. On July 9th, the foe was stayed. Ah, what a glorious fight was made, but what a bloody price was paid by bleeding 87. Monocacy that day ran red with blood by loyal heroes shed. All honor to the noble dead of glorious 87. For Stahl had held the bloody field and not an inch of ground would yield till by a triple force compelled the fighting 87. Here Dietrich Walsh and Martin died, Waltmar Spengler and Hack beside, with their lifeblood, the daisies died, ah, bleeding 87. And Captain Lannis, gallant aid, one staff of glorious first brigade, was found wherever duty laid, as was the 87. As orders to the left he bore, to fall back he was wounded sore, while inflating volleys tore the ranks of the 87. Brave Schultz and Lynchenburg here were by same bullet wounded queer, while facing foe without a fear, in G of the 87. But Washington was saved that day, as Great and Sheraton both say, by the Battle of Monocacy and the Gallant 87. And that's my presentation. Um, these are some links that you can go on. PA Roots is a really great website that has a lot of information, and it has the ranks of the 87th broken down by company. Um, it has the first and last names, and it usually has the hometown of the veteran so that you can do any research if you think that you have an ancestor in the 87th. Um, I highly recommend there is the History of the 87th by Daniel Brandt, um, and that is a great book that you can get. And he is basically like our historian for the 87th. Um, and you can also go to the York History Center if you're looking for any uh, local history information, um, Civil War related or not, but they, like I said, have amazing first-hand accounts, uh, diaries, letters that were written home. They have a lot of great resources. So that's where I would go if I was starting my research. Thank you.